So far, we have published five episodes separately covering the electromagnetic and iron drop topics. Following the viewer's request, we have digitally remastered the audio of all the five episodes into this marathon. Once you complete this marathon, you will have the industrial level knowledge of EM and IR in VLSI. This is a must-have marathon for all the physical design aspirants in VLSI. So, stay tuned, stay focused. Today, we are going to discuss about electromigration in analog and digital designs. So, what is electromigration? Let's see. Electromigration or EM is a aging come failure mechanism associated with the average and RMS current densities in metal or via interconnects. EM analysis is performed on cell external interconnects as signal and power nets. EM goes in a very positive feedback loop with temperature joule heating. If left undetected, it can lead to performance degradation and finally chief failure over time. So, let's see the physics happening in electromigration. A phenomena of molecular rearrangement happens in the solid phase caused by electromagnetic field. In addition, when current density gets too high, the momentum transfer from electrons start to happen. This result, collision, which causes drift of metal ions from their original position, depends on conductor, crystal size, magnitude of forces, temperature and mechanical stress. So, we have just talked about what EM is and what the physics happening. Now, let's see in VLSI how the damages are caused. In this photo, we can see a void is getting created in metal via metal connection. So, here we can see this will cause a open circuit in long run. Here, in a single metal wire, we can see it is causing the open circuit failure. Here, we can see hillocks are getting created and they will finally join the two parallel metal lines causing short circuit failure. So, we just have seen that what is the physics? and what the damage causes. But when we design any circuit in VLSI, we have to predict these things in advance so that the circuit don't go and damage over time. So for this, we have some predictability. This predictability comes from Black's equation. So Black's equation is a mathematical model for calculation of mean time to failure of any semiconductor circuit under the influence of electromigration. So, this is the mathematical form we can see in the screen and these are the components of that equation. This Black's equation is used to predict the mean time to failure for electromigration. Here, another important point, there is a basic thing, it's called bleach length. What is this? Anywhere that has a length below this threshold length will not fail by the electromigration. So, if any metal strip or any via is less than the bleach length, it will not harmed by the electromigration. Let's see how EM damages a metal or a via. What happened inside? First, the joule heating I square R caused by the currents in metal interconnects. If this heat is low, heat gets dissipated through the metal interconnects. If this is high, void or extrusion get generated in metal interconnects or vias. Void or extrusion narrows the metal route. This in turn increases the resistance. This again increases the heating effect. So, it acts in a very cumulative positive feedback and it goes on increasing. So, one is increasing another and finally the damage happens. So, here let's see the picture really what happens. First, increase of the local current density. This causes increasing in joule heating. This in turn increase the temperature. This starts the growth of void or extrusion. Now, these last two steps marked by red arrows keep on going in a positive feedback loop and finally, whatever was getting created, void or extrusion, that finally causes a disconnect or a short circuit and the circuit performance is damaged and in between stage, the performance is getting slowly degraded. Now, let's come to the method of EM detection. In VLSI design, we have to detect the EM in very advanced in the design stage. 
there are two different methodologies are there one is for the analog or the semi custom and second is for the digital the em analysis the physics behind is same but when we predict it during our designing process we have to follow different methodology for the prediction or the violation detection Before we go in detail of each of them let's see in a general bird's eye view what is a circuit and how it is detected and the violations mean the em violations so a circuit we can imagine as a interconnection of different cells by different nets so nets are shown in purple color here you can see here the purple color these are the nets and sky blue color these are the cells so generally the nets are extracted in spf format and the cells are extracted in dspf format so these are parasitic extraction later i will exemplify the spf and the dspf these are one of the prerequisite that we need to do so both type of analysis is done one is at the interconnect level and as well as the cell level because inside a cell there will be some metal wires and they can contribute to a em violation so we have to do both what inputs are required number 1 is rc parasitic spf for dspf these are two different formats i will differentiate them at later stage of this video cell or net specific data these will i also share what the data is and uh, technology specific em rules from the foundry okay this third point is very much important this rule actually gives the capping level up to which a metal doesn't show the current the rms current or the peak current whatever the current we are seeing in a net this threshold if not crossed it doesn't show the violation but if this threshold is crossed for any of the net metal via whatever that will be predicted as a potential em violation now i just give the overall bird's eye view of what things are needed and how we analyze in nets as well as cells so now let's jump into the analog or full or semi custom designs let's describe first the flow and let's see where the em stands in this entire flow so design specification then comes the schematic design then the basic circuit simulation is a functional simulation then the floor planning or partitioning then placement and custom routing then layout generation or changes then we do the drc and lvs then we extract the parasitics also abbreviated as pecs then in the next stage we do the em and ir analysis now a violation is there yes so we get the violation map and we go back to the layout overlay it and see the different hotspots and we do the necessary changes if there is no violation then we proceed towards the next steps so from layout generation or changes till the em analysis it happens in a loop until all the violations are cleared this is overall picture or the bird's eye view at what stage we analyze or predict the em and what things happen for a designer now let's see what things we do and the nature of the analysis in analog designs em has a unique flavor because currents in analog circuit vary from design to design yes so if your design is a pll it will be different if your design is a band gap it will be different if it's a dc dc it will be different so each design the analog circuit currents the levels of current i mean to say will be different it can vary from nanoamps to a few amps amps means where we are dealing with the power circuitry high power applications we are using in analog circuit it is important to note power rail vdd vss and signal interconnects carry currents nearly the same order so power nets and the signal nets have more or less same amount of current total number of nets pretty less than a digital design because analog semi or full custom design are handcrafted and so the designs will have less number of nets overall in analog designs say whether it is a full custom semi custom in any case we extract a dspf net list from the layout which includes r c c c plus the tail comments this is a very important point the tail comment and also the lvs log this netlist is then used to simulate the currents in the power nets as well as interconnects signal interconnects 
as I mentioned earlier, if any of these resulting currents densities exceed the EM safe boundary, a violation is flagged for that particular net and a violation map is generated. So, this could be GDS, RV, whatever and we overlay this violation map, the hotspot map over the actual layout and we point out the faulty points. So, this was for the analog designs. Now, let's come to the digital designs, generally the SOC or ASIC, whatever we call, how EM is done here. Before jumping to the details of the EM methodology, let's see the flow and where the EM is standing, at what stage we do the EM analysis to predict the potential threats. So, first the design specification, then RTL coding then verification, this is a functional verification, then synthesis, then the power routing, global placement, detailed placement, clock tree synthesis, then global and detailed routing, then layout generation and changes, then DRC and LVS, then the parasitic extraction, then EM and IR analysis comes. So, at this stage, the EM and IR analysis is done. If a violation is reported, yes, so, we go back to layout generation or changes. This continues until all the violations are corrected. Once there is no violation, we go towards the next steps. Now, let's see in a digital design, what are the important points for a EM analysis. Unlike the analog design, the power rails VDD VSS in a digital circuit carry DC current of nearly fixed magnitude and this is the most important point in a digital design. Clock and signal interconnects carry AC currents. AC means to say like pulse or PWL. The, hence, the current changes direction with respect to frequency. In a digital design, generally it's a huge as compared to analog design and massive amount of clock and signal interconnects connecting a sea of logic gates. So, here count of nets is huge. So, first, the EM critical nets are filtered out. So, this is the methodology inside the tools and it's their proprietary thing. Then, the SPIF, SPIF is extracted from the layout including R, C, C, C plus tail comment. The tail comment is the most important thing that must be there. Extracted for these EM critical nets. Then, spice simulations are performed on these nets to get the currents, that is average current, RMS current, peak current, whatever we are having. Now, we have the EM thresholds from foundry and if any of the resulting currents or the current densities exceed the EM safe boundary, a violation is flagged for that particular net and a total violation map is generated. Then, this violation is overlaid onto the actual GDS and hotspots are identified and corrected. Now, let's talk about the EM detection fundamentals. So, we have seen both analog and digital. Now, we are doing the crux of the analysis. So, what inputs we require? Parasitic, netlist, SPF for DSPF, test vector based on the functionality, SPICE model, SPICE options. Because to generate the currents, we have to do the SPICE simulation. The average RMS, peak, this kind of currents. These are combined into a SPICE deck. Then, transistor level SPICE simulation happens. In analog, we know that we do the SPICE simulation and in digital, we have just discussed that for EM critical nets, we do these things. This results peak RMS or average current. The worst current of each resistor is compared with the EM threshold and this threshold comes from the DRM. As a result, we generate the violation map, the metal or via which are having higher current than the allowable boundary limit as per the DRM are flagged as violations. So, it could be current or it could be current density, both. We just discussed the general methodology and now let's look into the SPF and DSPF, the similarities and the dissimilarities. So, here is a short snippet of a SPF. A SPF contains a header section, then a name map section. So, these nets are numbers and, and these you can see the hierarchies are also here. There will be a port section. Ports means the ports of the design. Layer map will be there. This layer map comes from the technology also because each layer in your layer in your layout will have a number and correspondingly it will have a layer name. So, like 21 is metal 1, 22 is VR and 23 is metal 2. Then, for each net, each particular net, 
net there will be a d net section so if we see d net here number 5 is there and this corresponds to net 1 from the name map so the details of this net including the parasitics will be there and in the register section we will see this red color tail comment it will contain width length and LVL LVL means this is the layer map layer number so 23 here means metal 2 in case of via instead of width and length there will be area reported the LVL will be still there so this is just a snippet of spef how does it look with the tail comment here the snippet of a DSPF is shown it will also contain a header section the difference between the SPF and DSPF is the DSPF is a ready for spice simulation so there will be a sub circuit definition there will be a net section so this net section the nets are described like ground net it will have its parasitics here the register is having the tail comment other nets are also there so i have just given a snippet and uh, here there will be the tail comments also another net and finally there will be an instance section so this is used in a spice simulation directly so here the spiced instances of the different internal parts will be there and there is a dot ends uh, at the end so this ends the spice sub circuit this is for a buffer right so a uh, sub circuit buffer ends here this is how uh, dspf is different because in uh, spf there will be no instance section in dspf it will be there a dspf is a spice ready format while the spf is not a spice ready format now we have discussed uh, the EM, its physics, its uh, detection methodology in both analog and digital. Now comes the mitigation part. Now mitigation part is same in either of the cases because we have to make the changes in the layout. We have to avoid 90 degree corners on high current nets, even distribution of multiple vias. We have to avoid abrupt wear width reduction. We have to double or multiple vias have to be used instead of single via which are getting violated. Length shortening of a metal or a via below the bleach length. Increase the wear width to reduce the EM. Avoid using the parasitic extraction RSPF. This is a reduced format. So we have to avoid this at all cost. We must use DSPF or SPF with tail commands. So here after the violation are detected, we have given the scenario how the violations are mitigated. This is not only the exhaustive list as per technological progress. We have different scenario, more scenarios and we act according to case by case basis. Hey guys, welcome to the 20th episode of Q&A. Viewer Satyanshu Prakash has asked in the episode of Electro Migration Analysis in Analog and Digital VLSI Designs. Can you please explain if the EM get affected with temperature, voltage and frequency? Today, we will be focusing on the impact of various heating effect inside the chip and how EM is impacted according to them. So, sit tight and enjoy the learning experience. Hey folks, welcome back to the computer screen. Today we are discussing the question from Satyan Prakash where he has asked to explain the details of effect of temperature, voltage and frequency on the electromigration. He has asked in the comment section of the video electromigration in analog and digital designs. Today we will be focusing on the effect of temperature on electromigration and we will cover the rest of the parts in upcoming episodes. So in today's episode we will be covering these topics. First introduction. Next we will revisit the Black's equation. We will discuss Black's equation interpretation in EM in VLSI. We will also do the graphical tour of the temperature versus mean time failure that is MTF. Next, we will look into the temperatures all of which coexist inside the chip. Next, we will consider all the heating effects inside the chip. Finally, we will summarize the entire discussed topics. So, here is the menu for today. Without any further delay, let's begin. Introduction. So, this particular introduction will be useful for those who haven't also watched that particular episode in which the question was asked by Satyanshu. You can go ahead watch this episode and then you can go back to that particular episode. There is no issue. Many of the IC failure reasoning either thermally activated or related. The IC failures are maximum impacted by the thermal reasons. 
Hence, predictive analysis is much more important in VLSI reliability analysis. Just to support the first point, I would like to emphasize here, you might have seen that in our CPU, we have a fan over it and we use the heating paste. Also in normal PCB, if we have an IC, which have a heat sink, we attach an aluminum piece to it to dissipate the heat. And also we use a thermal paste inside for the good conduction. All these observations you can have from your day-to-day -day life and you can now focus on to the actual VLSI reliability analysis because at the end it is made on silicon and the heat has to be tackled and that heat is a much more damaging factor than anything else. In VLS, we use the predictive analysis. Predictive means we use mathematical models inside the simulator and hence we predict that how long this particular chip will run before fail completely or before a significant damage is there. This is the importance of the predictive analysis. And when we do this predictive analysis in the physical verification stage, we take the help of the tools. Those are able to judge the long-term effect coming out of electromigration and can detect which and where all these failures may come. Accordingly, we take corrective actions so that we can mitigate the effects. Let's move on to the next point. There are various temperature generation mechanism in modern ICs. When you see that a IC particularly getting heated, you may think, okay, it is getting heated, but that heat if we split into components, it is contributed by multiple reasons. The heats are coming from multiple sources inside the chip, not outside the chip, inside the chip. And the temperature which is there in the ambience where the chip is operating, right? That temperature is already there. We are not talking about this. That particular ambient heat will be there. In addition, inside the chip, multiple heat sources are there. We will discuss today all of this. We are just having the introduction right now. A chip may go above 100 degrees Celsius during its practical operation. This is a very important point because advanced TPU casings, sometimes there are different kind of coolants are also used. Why all those coolants are used? Because the temperature goes high, you have to cool it down. If you do not cool it down, the thing will get damaged. Whether it is a CPU, whether it is a GPU, all these things. You will see there are metal fins on which we have used fans. We use more than one fan in the CPU box inside which we keep the entire motherboard and all the stuffs. However, in the design level we must take precautions that maximum extent we can prevent all these heatings rise in the temperature enhances solid state metal iron diffusion since the diffusion coefficient in solids is much smaller than liquids electromigration in solids occur at much slower rate this is a very important factor because the diffusion in liquid happens faster in solid it happens slow and hence it happens slowly but gradually but continuously over the time since it is kind of relevant to the human ages when we run for a long time and we become old that similar concept is coming here and that's why we call it aging the aging of the silicon chip where the functioning degrades to some predefined values Electromigration is caused by scattering of the moving electrons with the ions, that is, by momentum transfer between electrons and ions. This is a very simplistic way we have explained what happens inside the electromigration phenomenon by the physics. This ion-electron interaction, sometimes referred to as the electron wind. Someone say it is ion-electron interaction, someone might say electron wind. So you may find different terminology. So I have kept all these things so that you have a proper pointer here. So you can go in any direction or whenever you are reading any particular article, you will be able to interpret what it is meaning. So we are done with this particular slide. Let's move on. Black's equation. This equation is very important equation. I have explained it in the main episode on which the question was asked. However, I am repeating the equation here because it has a very much important significance. That's why you will come to know. Black's equation is a mathematical model for the calculation of mean time failure, that is MTF, for a semiconductor circuit in VLSI, which is under influence of electromigration. And one thing I would like to clarify, electromigration is not only for the VLSI thing, it happens, it's a basic physics. However, since we are focusing on the VLSI electromigration, we are focusing much more on the things that happen in the VLSI. So here is the equation of the mean time failure. You can see, let me bring my mouse. Here you can see the T factor and the temperature in Kelvin. This equation you can see at left hand side as Y we have MTF. X is here which is T. So it simplified a way we can say that 
This is e to the power 1 by x. And if we plot a simple x versus e to the power 1 by x here in a normal graph, this kind of graph will show up. So I have kept only the positive axis. I have not gone in other axis. This is the plus x and plus y axis. So here goes our x and here goes our e to the power 1 by x. So this will be a kind of mathematical representation in the graph. So you can have an idea that how this equation can have a representation. Later we will show how actually this MTF is uh, plotted in graph. Don't worry. So the components in this particular equation are a is the cross section area dependent constant, J is the current density, P e is the Boltzmann constant, P e is the temperature in Kelvin, N is the model parameter. All these things are there. I have highlighted this T with a different color because today in this episode we are focusing on temperature that is the heating effect here hence our focus will be entirely on the t part today so i have explained the significance of the black's equation in today's episode as well as in the electromigration so one more thing here is q is the activation energy so we are done with this particular slide so let's move on to the next slide black's equation interpretation in em or vlsi probability of failure is termed as the failure fraction now these are mathematical terms that correlates the mean time failure and how the industry expects the, all the failures. So in this slide, we will be focusing on these terminologies which are used to judge the failure and represent the failure. And that's how the VLSI industry categorizes and depicts the failure. Industrial markets demand low failure rate expressed as defective parts per million abbreviated as DTTM over the entire cheap lifetime. Few slides back I have just talked about the aging. So here you can see the cheap lifetime. Both are synonymous. VLSI reliability engineers translate this chip level specification to specific fail fraction targets in units of failure in times that is FIT on individual resistors. So these things lay well inside your simulator these are calculated and sometimes in the figure of merit of any silicon chip all these factors may come the classic black's equation relates the mean time failure now you can correlate all the terminologies that i have just depicted in this particular slide failure fraction dppm fit and now mtf so all these are correlated in Black's equation, P corresponds to the contribution from the ambient temperature as well as current induced temperature rise due to the joule heating. So don't worry, we will talk about all other components. But for now, you can just bank upon that the T corresponds to the ambient temperature as well as the rise in the joule heating. These two components are for sure there contributes to T. There are other components come later. Temperature versus MTF. Here in this particular slide, we will be not plotting but kind of visualization this is the x-axis which is time y-axis is the temperature so this is a rough idea just for things to get into your mind now this green dot represents the mtf so you can see if the temperature is low lifetime is large here as the temperature go high so you can see the mean time failure point shifts left side and the time span is much less than the previous one in the similar way if we go higher in the temperature the point comes closer in the timeline and we go and much more higher and much more higher the point comes closer that means with higher temperature we have a less lifetime of a chip that means a faster aging so this is the purpose of this particular graphical representation so generally we have time here it is long so the life is long of this particular chip and for this particular chip where the temperature is going really high the lifespan is much much less than this one so this way you can visualize how the temperature impacts the aging and behind this only we have taken consideration of the electromigration you can recall the black equation you can recall the e to the power 1 by x graph we, i have just shown you sometimes back and now i will show you the graph that is used in the industry this is the graph let me point with the mouse so here we can see the delta t and here here is the ratio that is mtf by mtf of 300k plus delta t so this way the industry plots the graph and uh, don't get confused this is a logarithmic scale okay so this one is a logarithmic scale and here is the delta t so this way in the silicon tip the mtf is plotted with the delta t so folks we are done with this particular slide so let's move on
temperatures coexist inside the chip so far we have discussed about the black's equation the different terminologies those are used to represent the lifetime in the figure of merit how different companies will exchange data about the lifetime which all leading to the electro migration right now we will see the effect of multiple temperatures on the electro migration before that let us take a tour of on what type of sources of the heat inside the chip first the metal interconnect joule heating so it could be metal it could be via anything so joule heating we already know that causes the heating which is a kind of primary reasoning for the electro migration next we have the ambient heat inside the chip this is obvious the chip has to operate in ambience next is the sy self heating you must know that utsy cmos are nowadays a lot of popular because of low leakage factor however sy increases the self heating it's a huge effect and i think in many simulators this self heating effect is nowadays also getting considered for the em and one more thing the finfet and gate all around devices some of them are bulk however many of them are sy devices whether it is a cmos basic cmos or the finfet or the gate all around the sy impact of the self heating is there nowadays we also focus for the em violation we consider the self heating effect next high frequency switching operation released heat so generally we are talking about the electro migration and nowadays the circuits which we use in our day to day operation operate at very high frequency maybe in the gigahertz rate or it may be higher all those high frequency switching operation you can visualize uh, when it is switching right the current is moving to and fro in the metal or the via and that movement is causing a lot of heat because electrons are moving in opposite direction with the change of the polarity during the switching operation all those things goes to the basic physics i think you already know it now all these heating effects are considered together and we can think that all those are contributing to the t here you can see the t this temperature is the final product of all these heat source that just been explained in this particular slide so we are done with this particular slide let's move on heating effects inside the chip now we'll discuss about the effects all these heat sources one by one designs at below 10 nanometer node are typically based on pin fits and gate all around fits i just mentioned about this even i think in the last slide pin fit and gate all around devices also suffer from significant self fitting effects as i mentioned these pin fits most of them and the gate all around may be on the sy devices to reduce the leakage and hence the self fitting effect coming into the play one more thing i would like to mention because the buried oxide layer the heat cannot dissipate but for bulk it can dissipate through the substrate zone however for buried oxide layer if it is there for the sy devices the heat cannot go out so the heat which you are getting generated stays within the chip that is the self heating the high transistor density gives rise in the high heat flux inside the chip so this is another cumulative effect which we have inside the chip there will be millions of gates right so there we have multiples of those millions as the basic transistors those all transistors are contributing to the heat and adding up the total heat inside the chip the packaged chip goes high in addition inefficient heat removal paths give rise to the thermal ambient i would like to mention one thing here the chip may have or may not have a heat sink or the filaments that we see usually outside the cpu or something like that however the fact is that whatever is getting conducted out of there may not be well connected to all of the path where it is generating the heat so this is the main theme of this particular line the thermal conductivity in the confined region of the silicon fin is degraded due to lattice vibrations that is phonons plus the addition buried oxide layer in the sy fin fits or the oxide that surrounds the nanowires in ga fit so here another physics has been touched base because of the lattice vibration it also generates some energy right and some of that energy could get converted to the heat and which will finally contribute to the temperature so this phonon vibration can directly or indirectly contribute to the heating effect you have now a picture in your mind of all the things that is getting the heats generated inside the chip let's move on to the next slide let us summarize all the things we have discussed so far 
all active and passive components and the wire interconnect dissipate heat during the circuit operation. Even in silicon, sometimes we create both kind of devices. High frequency power loss and consequent heat dissipation contributes in increased temperature. This situation is further worsened with addition of heat high ambient temperatures. All of these above mentioned temperatures reinforce EM by contribution of thermal energy towards the electron wind. This is a very important point of this episode, right? All the heating effects we have talked about, all those temperatures reinforce the EM by throwing energy towards the electron wind. Rise in the temperature enhances solid state metal ion diffusion, which is in turn enhances electromigration effect. Combination of high heat flux and or high current densities driven in the advanced designs, EM can cause more damage in lower metal layers. So folks, with this particular slide and all these points I have discussed throughout this particular episode, things might have cleared in your mind with respect to the physics point of view that what is the effect of temperature on the electromigration and hence the aging of the chip. So we are done with this particular slide, let's move on. Hey guys, welcome to the 21st episode of Q&A. Viewer Satyanshu Prakash has asked in the episode of Electromigration Analysis in Analog and Digital VLSI Designs, can you please explain how the EM get affected with temperature, voltage and frequency. In last episode, we have already covered the effect of the temperature on electromigration. Today, we will be focusing on the effect of voltage and frequency on electromigration. So sit tight and enjoy the learning experience. Hey guys, welcome back to the computer screen. In today's episode, we will be discussing about your Satyanshu Prakash question to explain the effect of temperature, voltage and frequency on electromigration, which he has asked in the episode of Electromigration in Analog and Digital Designs in this particular channel. In the last episode, we have discussed about the effect of temperature on electromigration. Today, we are going to discuss about the impact of the voltage and frequency on the electromigration. So, without any further delay, let's begin. Here we go with the menu for today. First, we will talk about the electromigration and voltage and introduction. Next, we will discuss about the impact of the voltage on electromigration in detail and in the next section, we will talk about its mitigation. Next, very important uh, concept we will discuss what is a stress in various circuits or any of the semiconductor circuits or any of the electronic circuits. Next, we will move on to the next section where we will discuss about the effect of frequency on electromigration and introduction. Next, we will go further deep by discussing the effect of unipolar pulsed DC waveform on electromigration. We will further analyze the effect of bipolar AC waveform on electromigration. Finally, we will move on to the conclusion. So folks, this is the menu for today. Without any further delay, let's begin. In this section, we will be talking about electromigration and voltage. Introduction Increasingly small IC structures begin to have a significant negative impact on reliability because the cross-sectional areas of the metallic interconnects in the ICs are diminished in size. This is the scenario that is in present days we are going through right now. The problem arises because the required currents cannot be reduced to the same ratio and proportion even by reducing the supply voltage and gate capacitance. So if you are familiar with the ITRS technology roadmap where it is defined for each particular technology node, what will be the gate capacitance, what will be BDD and all these minute details are there. So even in that particular roadmap, if we go and see, we will find that the currents cannot be bring down in the same ratio and proportion. In digital circuit, the voltage in the rails is constant for a particular technology node. So I just mentioned about the ITRS roadmap, right? If you go there, you will see that this VDD will remain constant for a particular technology node. 
for multi-vdd powered domains inside a chip the interaction points are balanced by level shifters nowadays a lot of multi-vdd powered domain chips are getting manufactured so there we have generally a power management block which controls all the power going to different sections they may have different vdd applicable to that particular block so there we use level shifters i just touch base this point because in today's scenario this is also a very relevant information as compared to the previous bullet where i have mentioned for a particular technology not the vdd must be remain constant and in present scenario how we deal with such different situation where we need a separate kind of vdd here we use a level shifter in the digital plus analog mixed signal circuits voltage level difference at the boundary are balanced by the a to d and d to a converters now in present days the mixed signal chips here and there are a lot in production if you look into them what you will find that uh, there are analog blocks which also coexist with the digital block so the third point where we have said that vdd remains constant that also get a bit change because the analog circuit may require a different power supply voltage and the voltage exchange in between these two blocks has to be exchanged with the interpreter that is a to d or d to a converter based on which direction the signal is propagating so this is another important point signal nets are less wide than the power grid nets i just re-emphasize this fact for a power grid to function as intended, the voltage drop at each of its nodes should be smaller than a certain threshold. Otherwise, timing violation and logic failures may occur. So now this, the voltage node means it is a circuit concept, not the physical chip concept. In a circuit, we have different nodes from where the branches go out into different directions, carrying the power to different parts of the circuit. Now, these nodes should remain static in terms of their voltage level. This special value as per the design rule manual. This all comes from the DRM, which comes from the foundry. We are done with this particular slide. Let's move on. Here we will discuss about the impact of voltage on electromigration. In last slide, we have talked about the basic fundamentals. Now we will zoom in further down inside the circuit. In EM process, the voltage dependence of the resistance R as a function of V is expected to be a constant. It may have a positive slope due to the Joule heating. Usually, RV displays a positive slope corresponding to a negative curvature in the corresponding IV characters. Over the time, voids may be formed at locations with high tensile stress, which results in a resistance increase and voltage drop degradation let me explain this point due to electromigration two things happen one a hillock is created or a void is created now if a void is created what will happen the cross section of the current carrying metal or via will get reduced and hence the resistance will increase if the resistance get increased the voltage drop degrades so this is the way the things are happening the power grid is deemed to have failed if the voltage drop at any grid node exceeds a user-specified threshold. We refer to this as a voltage failure. This all specifications come from the design as well as from the DRM. These things have to be maintained. The EM lifetime of the grid refers to the time at which the EM-induced voltage failure is expected to happen. So this is the entire picture of the failure of a power grid in terms of the voltage we are done with this particular slide so let's move on let us continue the discussion with few more points the critical volume of a void is the threshold above which the interconnect is permanently damaged this is very much clear the volume corresponds to a critical resistance rise that either two of the condition let us see those two first causes a voltage drop across the interconnect to impair proper functioning of the circuit or leads to severe thermal damage generating out of joule heating due to the power dissipation in the interconnect 
In addition, the digital circuit are less sensitive to small voltage changes than their analog counterparts. This is we know very well. In digital, we have 0 and 1 level and in analog, we have exact voltage. So, the digital circuits are less impacted by the small voltage change. For the 0, generally we have a small band and for 1, we also have a small band of voltage. So, anything change within that particular band will not impact the particular level. The proper functioning of the digital logic depends essentially on the reliable differentiation between a few different digital logic states. Also, these circuits comprise a relatively small number of different types of sub-circuits called gates. We have discussed a lot of points regarding the impact of the voltage on EM. It's a bit different than how the current is impacting on EM. You already know by the, all the points that have been discussed here. So, let's move on to the next slide. Mitigation. When any problem comes to an engineer, the engineer finds a way to resolve it and hence the term mitigation comes into the mind. In recent times, the wiring material was also changed from aluminium to copper due to its specific property. The lower specific resistance of copper resulted in a lower time constant which gave rise to the higher signal frequencies. This in turn caused a lower voltage drop and lower tail fitting in the interconnects. The changeover boosted overall electromigration robustness. We are done with this particular slide, so let's move on. We are done with the discussion of voltage impact on EM. Before going to the next section, here I will just touch base the concept of stress in an electronic circuit. When a circuit component, either active or passive, or interconnect, that is metal or via, is connected to either or combined under a constant voltage, under a constant current, under a constant temperature, we call it is under stress of that specific kind, whether it is pure or mixed. So, this is the concept of stress. You will come across this particular term in the next section. That's why I explain this in a very simple manner. We are done with this particular slide, so let's move on to the next slide. In this section, we will be talking about the electromigration and frequency. Introduction Damage caused by the electromigration generally due to the unidirectional current. This is nothing but the DC current. So the basic physics on which the electromigration concept tends is derived by the DC current flow. Now, AC causes bidirectional current flow with change in the polarity. That's why it is called the alternating current. In two parts of a AC period, that is on time and off time, the direction of the flux of the electron wind is completely opposite. Those who don't know the concept of the electron wind, please watch the last episode here I have mentioned about this particular turn and also I have explained in the main episode. In VLSI designs, such periodic waveform, that is AC, comes from a clock and corresponding dependent signal transmission to the metal or via interconnects. An AC signal can be different nature, that is, of the varieties are unipolar pulsed DC, bipolar AC and peak current. Each have their own way of response to the electromigration effect for metal or via. Here we are done with the particular slide. Let's move on to the next slide. Ascent of the unipolar pulsed DC waveform. We can imagine the minimum void getting created due to the electron wind. This void creation time is less than the on time period of the signal being transmitted. We add up faster of the growth of the void. Now folks, please remember we are talking about AC. So there will be a on period and there will be a off period because this is a unipolar pulsed AC waveform. On the other hand, if the time of the void creation is more than the on time period of the signal being transmitted, then it will negatively affect the growth of the void. Negatively affects means that will reduce the growth or the rate of growth will be less than the previous condition in the last bullet. When we are applying a very high frequency signal, the electron wind cannot react to the on and off periods 
and only feel an average current density. So by the last two points, you understand that a particular electron wind can contribute to a void if void creation time is less than on period. On the other hand, if the, the void creation time is much larger than the on time, then the rate of void creation will be reduced and hence such waveform, if it has a high frequency, this means this change is very fast, then the electron wind going through the on and off period feels only the average current density. When the frequency is very low, automatic gradient is built up during the on time period. During the off time period, such atomic gradients brings relaxation. However, if the metal or via is much longer than the bleach length, this relaxation is insignificant compared to the EM induced damage. So folks, we are done with this particular slide. So let's move on to the next slide. Effect of the bipolar AC waveform. If the frequency is less than a critical frequency, that is the frequency needs to react the DC equilibrium, the interconnect will follow DC EM behavior. This is the condition for the bipolar AC waveform where we have the AC swing both sides of the y equal to zero axis. And here comes term that is never heard before in the discussion of the electromigration that is a critical frequency. When the frequency is beyond the critical frequency that means the circuit operation frequency is much higher than the critical frequency gradual enhancement in the mean time failure happens along with the frequency increment. Now what do you mean by the enhancement in the mean time failure? That means the point of the failure go away from the origin that is x equal to 0 or time equal to 0 point. In last episode I have explained this mean time failure with the infographics there I have explained this. So that point of the MTF will go away further. Such phenomenon results in improved effectiveness of the damage healing due to the reverse stress period. In an AC, right, when the swing is in opposite direction in the two part of the half cycles, the direction of the electron wind is completely opposite. So in one case, the electron will try to create a void and in the another part of the swing, it will try to heal it. So this is the nature because the direction of the electron wind is completely opposite and hence the momentum transfer to the metal ions is also in a different direction. So if that momentum transfer is in different direction then definitely in fast half of the swing or in the positive swing the void whatever amount it was getting created in the second half that means the opposite swing those voids be healed a bit. At the beginning of the positive and negative pulses, atoms and voids start to migrate along the grain boundaries or interfaces. This migration is able to recover with the opposite stress. Now here you can see the term stress which I explained few slides back. And this stress means when a circuit is under operation right, that particular circuit operates for a long time and hence any of the stress could happen that I have explained in the last slide. A shorter stress period means a relatively smaller displacement of atoms and voids which are easily healed. Material migration in one direction can partially migrate back to its original location under beneficial condition. Consequently, the interconnect suffers less damage from the electromigration under AC conditions. Here we are talking about the bipolar AC waveform. That means in the two half of the AC, one swing is completely in the opposite direction. Means that in the first half, if the swing is in the positive y axis, in the second half, it will be in the negative y axis. So in such condition, the last point applies. So, folks, we are done with this particular slide. Let's move on. We continue here with few more points. Under ideal conditions, the magnitudes of both current and pain in the positive or negative half cycle, then no electromigration effect could take place. So this is a very ideal condition. However, in real condition, there will be a little bit difference. Within a quite high frequency range, the damage healing process can overcome all defects which are brought during the other half of the period and there should be no EM at all. Consequently, the MTF would go to infinity. 
So if you can recall the slide in the last episode where I have shown the infographics about the shifting of the MTF point, that point here in this particular bullet as per the condition will move towards the infinity. The lifetime of a metal or via carrying alternating currents AC is significantly longer than the wear that with the direct currents DC due to the damage healing properties of the AC waveform that so far we have discussed. However, in high frequency AC current density as a DC offset, the DC component will determine the actual EM lifetime. In addition to this, the thermal stress due to the joule heating alone will contribute to the degradation in the metal or via and lifetime based on the RMS current density. So even though you can see that the AC waveform has its own healing way of the void creation, however, its associations, the DC component or the joule heating, both these things will contribute or the damage. The temperature gradients alone brings the metal ion flux divergence and cause the failure. So the void which we are getting earlier moving due to the electron wind, due to the momentum transfer to the ions, they will get the energy from the thermal conditions and under the thermal stress, this void creation will get enhanced and damage will happen to the metal or via. In addition, the EM effect that is coming from the DC part of that particular AC will contribute to this damage. That's how the overall damage happens in an AC circuit. So folks, we are done with this particular slide. So let's move on to the next slide. Conclusion. At lower frequencies, on each half cycle, metal ions influenced by electron wind have ample time to migrate far out of the hot region into the cooler adjacent wear segments. Consequently, their thermal motion is largely frozen out upon reversal of the electron wind. Thus, damage is added up over the time elapse. At higher frequencies, the switching time for the electron wind force direction is reduced. The hot junction can begin to experience reversible ion movement under reverse electron wind. However, high frequency AC current density as a DC offset, the DC component will determine the actual EM lifetime. Further damage is caused due to the accumulation of the joule heating. We are done with this particular slide, so let's move on. If asked in interview, do you know the difference between static and dynamic IR drop analysis? Do you know the difference between SOC level IR drop analysis versus IP level IR drop analysis? Do you know what are the IR drop hotspots found inside a chip? Let's start our journey to know all the answers. Hey guys, welcome back. In today's episode, we are going to discuss uh, below points. Power delivery network its significance on IR drop analysis. Next, we will cover the definitions of IR drop and ground bounds. Next, we will show the position of IR drop in both the design flows of the IP design as well as the ASIC design flow. Next, we will touch base on some of the fundamentals of resistance, ACL, AVL, and circuit and parasitics. Next, we'll do a classification of static and dynamic IR drop analysis. Next, we will show the IR drop and its impact on the timing analysis. Next, we will talk about the IR drop effects to be found for multiple power domains. Finally, we will talk about the IR drop thermal hotspot detections and its mitigation methods. So, that's the menu for today. Without any further delay, let's begin. Introduction. For continuous downsizing of the technology nodes, the chip operating frequency is continuously increasing at which the timing related defects coming out of high speed tests are high in proportion. Now folks, you might have noticed that today your mobile phone processor, the gigahertz processing speed is increasing with every new generation and IR drops are very much relevant for this high speed switching operation. We'll come to that point later. DFT techniques may cause the test vectors to contain non-functional states which result in higher switching activities compared to the functional modes of operation specific scenario. Excessive switching activity causes higher power dissipation which in turn may cause higher drop hotspots that could damage the circuit. 
due to the higher air drops which increase signal propagation delays during the test causing yield loss. Power Delivery Network the power grid simulation in ASIC causes power delivery network abbreviated as EDN to turn on all the leaf cells inside any VLSI circuit. Here is a short and sweet diagram of the power delivery network which is easy to understand. Now let me point out the uh, parts and components of this power delivery network. This is power ring. There are two types of power rings since we have shown in two different colors. One is VDD, another one is VSS. Next is the power strip. Here, these take out lines from the power rings into the cells. So, there are again two colors because of the two different supply voltage that is PDD and VSS. This one is called IO pad. This one is called IO pillar. This one is called corner cell. And this area is the core where our silicon chip resides. So, the power delivery network, as you can see from the figure, distributes the power that is VDD and VSS lines into the core area. IR drop is a uh, excess voltage drop caused by parasitic RLC of the metal routes from the PDA, happening even before the desired voltage can reach the target power pins of the standard cell. IP blocks or macro blocks. So, as per this particular definition, the IR drop happens well before the actual voltage from the power rings as shown in the right hand side could reach up to the specific standard cell or macro blocks or any IP block to the power strip. Power buses carry large DC current causing the large IR drop which in turn gradually reduces VDD towards the center of a chip when the power supply is driven by pads around the perimeter. So, here in this slide, we have shown you the short and sweet diagram of a power delivery network and explained in a nutshell how IR drop happens to this power delivery network. IR drop and ground bounce the total IR drop is further divided into resistive and inductive subcomponents. Here is a simple graph to explain the two subdivisions. This is our VDD line. This is our ground line. Now, the resistive voltage drop, also known as on-chip IR drop, is mostly due to the voltage drop because of the on-chip metal or via interconnect resistance. Here in this diagram, this small drop is called the IR drop. The inductive drop, also known as the DIDT noise, is mostly caused by the in package inducted. The DIDT noise, often referred to as simultaneous switching noise, also known as round bounce, which is caused by rapid changes in the current passing through the parasitic inductors in the power network. And here in this figure, this bump is a round bounce. So, you can see the, the two components of the IA drop, the total IA drop are shown in the right hand side figure with a drop and a bump or the VDD line and the ground line. Both of these contributes to the IA drop as a whole. So, we are done with this particular slide. Let's move on to the next slide. IA drop in IP or analog design and ASIC design. Here in this slide, our flow proceeds in the direction of this arrow and in the left hand side we will keep the IP design or the analog design flow and in the right hand side we will keep the ASIC design flow. Here the graphics are used as a symbolical meaning so that you can identify easily whatever I have just mentioned now. So, first in the IP or the analog design part the schematic design is done by the designers. Next we draw the layout by hand. Next, we do the ERC and LVS check on the layout and make sure that the layout is clean of any DRC or LVS violations. Next, we do the parasitic extraction abbreviated as EX and other set of physical verification. Next, we do the EM and IR drop analysis. Generally, these two are paid or analyzed side by side because of their similarity in their nature. In this channel, I have already created one episode on EM analysis in both the IP or asset design flow. Next, in this flow comes uh, characterization and delivery. So, because this is an IP, you have to characterize it means the electrical characterization and final packaging of this IP. So, we are done with the flow of of the IP design. Let us move on to the ASIC design flow. First, there is a front end design part. We are not going in a detail because that would take much more space and not very much relevant in this particular case. 
Next, we do the load planning and PNR. As we proceed further in the backend side, we have the ERC and LVS check after the floor planning, ENR and the layout is done. This step make sure that the layout is ERC and LVS clean. Next, we have the parasitic extraction abbreviated as PEX and uh, rest of the physical verification text. In the next step, we do the EM and IR drop analysis. Finally, we do the formal verification and we proceed towards the sign off. So, you can see that the IR drop analysis is performed in both IP level as well as the ASIC design level in this particular highlighted step. The purpose of this particular slide is done. So let's move on to the next slide. Resistance of metal strip and ACL AVL. Here in this slide, we'll look back and touch base some of our fundamental concepts which will help you to understand the IR drop analysis and phenomena altogether. We have a very close relation of the current resistance and voltage that is I, R and V. You can see the triangle and we can have several combinations with these three particular components in multiple expressions of a circuit. Next, this is a metal wear and this it is very much similar to the metal routes where the resistivity rho is A into R by L is the cross sectional area, A is the length, R is the resistance. This is a very fundamental concept and uh, this concept is used as is in the resistance calculation of the metal routes in the BEOL part of the chip design process. So, the next one is ACL, the research of current law where we know that the uh, sum of all the currents reaching to a particular node is zero, which we can express by an equation that is I1 plus I2 is equal to I3. As per the direction, whatever current is coming towards the node, here shown in the picture, leaving the node. All these concepts are very much important in the IR drop analysis. And we are going to give further in further slides. The KVL, that is Kirchhoff's voltage law. Also, we can imagine from this circuit here, you can see all some of the all voltage drops equal, that is I in, in nodes as well as the recipe. So, I have touched with the basic physics here in this particular slide so that you can now correlate in a very fine gradient concept of IR drop analysis in upcoming slides. So, we are done with this particular slide. Let's move on. Simple circuit diagram and parasite. This is our simple circuit diagram where we are using the MOS and this is without parasitic. So this is just for your understanding here and once we have the post layout version that means layout is done, we are done with the DRC LVS and we have extracted in the parasitic extraction process that is EEX. We have uh, with parasitics that means circuit plus extracted parasitics because of the actual layout or the wearing that come in a real picture of a chip simple circuit shown in the left hand side becomes like this where you have lot of resistance and capacitances here you can see in the right hand side it's real, very clearly shown here although this is not explicit however this is a very exemplary purpose that is this is how the resistances and capacitances will come around any node that we are working also again i emphasize this is not an actual case or actual circuit this is just for your understanding how the parasitics in the post layout process will come and get attached to different nodes because these parasitics will contribute for the em and ir element we're done with this particular slide let's move on to the next slide IR drop classification. So we have our IR drop grossly aggregated in two parts. First one is the static one, the static IR drop, and the next one is the dynamic IR drop. So this very simple classification. Now in upcoming slide, we will touch base both a static and dynamic IR drop analysis one by one. We are done with this particular slide. Let's move on to the static IR drop analysis. The IR drop is defined as the I average into the resistance segment, that is R where segment. Here I mentioned the word static, here IR drop static means the static IR drop and I average uh, well known quantities, the average current you have come across already in your textbook. And resistance R where segment, we have just shown you in the pictorial representation what the resistance segment looks like for a metal drop. Now this I average is uh, all factors out of the leakage currents. Here you can see a simple representation of uh, various metal layers that is going through. So if we say the horizontal ones, the first one 
here it will be 1, be metal 2, B, and this could be metal 4. However, you can see inside I have drawn the resistances. Once the parasitic extraction tool prints up any of the metal out, it will split into multiple resistors and they will be connected in the either in the TSPF or in the F file as like this. So resistance 1, resistance, resistance, three resistance. If you see their nodes, they will be also in the synchronous of connectivity. So this is a simple picture of the R where segment that you can manage and the power delivery network part and when the power comes in i have shown few slides back as a pictorial with that and this in the mind and then proceed for our next explanation points static ir drop is an average voltage drop for the design hence it is stimulus vector dependent vectors are taken from one the switching probabilities of each cell and number two applied switching probability of initial cell the average current depends totally on the time period of the clock. This is very fundamental. If you go back in the definition of I average current, you will find out in the mathematical example. Static I drop is dependent on the RC of the power grid connecting the power supply to the respective standard cell. That is what I mentioned that we already have shown up PDN few slides back and this metal route. You can see that uh, all these uh, things will be coupled together for uh, airdrop analysis. We're done with the particular slide. On to the next slide for few further points on static airdrop. The BDN reduced to a resistive network and a voltage drop across this resistive network is calculated based on a given current source. Loads are assumed to be driven by BDN. The static IR drop is performed around all the production RC and PVT corners combined. So I have two separate episodes about the RC corners and the PVT corners in the same VLSI FAQ. You can find out them in the FAQ playlist. In case you are not familiar with the RC and PVT corners, please go ahead and watch to have an in-depth knowledge in VLSI. The static IR drop is often across all the combination from RC and PVT corners so that we have the full coverage. Next, gate channel leakage current is the major reason for the static IR drop. There's another good point. Static IR drop was good or sign of analysis in older technology now, where the sufficient natural decoupling capacitance from the power network and non-switching logic was available. About the nodes which are beyond 130 nanometer, higher than 130 nanometer, or 9, all those technology now down below. Right now, today we are on below 10 nanometer. Dynamic IR drop is a lot of signal. That's why we have a point. Sometimes switching factors can uh, derive from the functional waveforms of the safe or the VCD files. We are done with this particular static IR drop analysis. Now let's move on to the dynamic IR drop analysis. Dynamic IR drop. Unlike static method, in reality, no two cells inside chip receive the same apply voltage due to placement, nearby cell activity, and dynamic nature of its operation. So here you can see one simple diagram. Here is our clock pulse, the black line horizontal is our ideal VDD and the line, red line with the wings is our real VDD which is in sync with the clock pulse you can see here. Here in X axis we have kept the time and in Y axis we have kept the voltage although you cannot see the X and Y axis here. Now I have uh, shown you the VDD and the black line horizontal is our ideal ground. And the line with the wings that is shown in green, that's why I have kept the color same, is our real ground. So these are the two things you are going to get explanation in the upcoming points. Thus, each standard cell have its unique dynamic voltage signature for the power or the ground pin. Cycle to cycle, the dynamic voltage variation depends on overall change in the peak current which causes the RLC oscillation or noise in the board or IC packaging and understand the wings that shown in the right hand side picture that is in the real VDD and real down comes from the RLC oscillation or noise. Number two, change in the toggle rate of the local cells which could result in temporary depletion of charge and high frequency noise drop. We have covered some points, we are yet to cover further more points on dynamic IR drop. So let's move on to the next slide. Here, the PDN is modeled as a network of the impedance and time domain or transient analysis is done. And see in the right hand side, I have said that we have kept the time in the X axis. And when we do any analysis with respect to time, it referred as the transient analysis. So, because of the RLC and we are seeing the swings, we do the transient analysis on the PDN. And the PDN is seen as the combination of the RLC. Those are parasitics, those are not from the design intended point of view. Here, the IR drop is caused by high speed switching transistor inside logic cells. Peak current demand puts off when a large number of circuitry switches at the same time. 
Hence, dynamic IR drop is less dependent on a clock period and can't be modeled by your traditional static timing analysis. So, you can see from the right hand side, there will be a lot of swings that is coming out of the RLC and uh, this would cause a big current shoot off and that's very much related with the dynamic IR drop analysis. And this is dynamic in nature that is time. So, it cannot be modeled with the static timing analysis where we are performing everything in static manner. That means all our pre-characterized values and not in the on-the-go analysis that we do in our transient analysis. So, in case you have some confusions about the static timing analysis, we also have a playlist in this channel. So, go there into the playlist and start from first episode. There are a couple of episodes which contains the theoretical part and as well as we cover the hands-on practical lectures here in the playlist. So, go ahead and watch them. Preventive IR drop analysis and investigative analysis is says pattern specific. Here, whatever the dynamic thing we are dealing with is very much dependent on the test pattern. Why we talk about test pattern? Because the high switching frequency that we are talking about in the context of dynamic IR drop comes from various test patterns that we can generate. Those detections of the dynamic IR drop will be through the test patterns of various kinds. So, done with this particular slide, let's move on to the next slide. IR drop and timing analysis. Undetected IR drop can be compensated by wind of increasing the supply. Extreme cases, this would lead also to timing analysis failure, whose root cause is higher voltage drop of a specified threshold or margin. Dynamic IR drop neither can be detected nor can be modeled by static timing analysis. Altogether, the IR drop can cause data violations on the data path signals. Here is our example from the STA playlist where we have on the setup violation using the open timer, open timer tool. And IR drop can cause hold time violations on the clock tree network. Here in the playlist, we have also shown the hold violation using the open timer tool. And uh, these are the explanation or snapshots from the episodes in the STA playlist. Delay of a cell depends on the voltage difference that is CDD minus VSS both functions of T that means both are transient as we have shown in the light before. This delay increases with the increase of standard cell threshold voltage while we vary the threshold voltage in a manner for the standard cell for the different categories like ULVT, LVT, SVT, HVT and UHVT. These are various standard cell packages for different threshold voltage. ULVT is ultra low VT, LVT is low VT. SVT is the standard threshold voltage, HVT is the high threshold voltage and EVHVT is ultra high threshold voltage. So, keeping all the points in mind and see that with the hit on the setup and hold violation as well as in the delay, the altogether the timing analysis is get affected by the IR drop happening in an actual check. We are done with this particular slide. Let's move on to the next. IR drop with multiple power domains. Power distribution among multiple power domain E is the abbreviation. In a single chip is significant in floor planning and placement phases. So here you can see one diagram that is a block diagram for a power domain blocks in a chip. So let me bring out my mouse. So whenever we have different power domains, we definitely we have a controlling block called the power management block. And here PD1 that is the power domain 1 will have VDD1, PD2 will have the VDD2, PD3 will have the VDD3. So I have just named it maybe a digital block, analog block and some macro that you have purchased from your another vendor. This is a typical representation of the different power domains I have explained about the power domains in detail in the UPF series and you can find the lectures on the UPF in the UPF playlist of this channel. Proceeding forward, the next point is the PNR tool synthesizes the power distribution network based on the power budget specification for each domain while keeping the power network constraint under consideration. Because of all the blocks you can see in the right hand side picture, Budgeting has to be in a proper way so that proper voltage, if there are three different VDDs in a single circuit, they will receive in a proper manner. IR drop map is used to analyze the power network. We will later come to the IR drop map. If analyzed maximum IR drop is not acceptable, then reconstraint and resynthesize are done. So these are engineering changes that we do as per our analysis, the IR drop. 
After the IR drop becomes acceptable, the new floor plan is created with added power or ground pad. I have shown the pads in the first or second slide in this particular lecture. So we are done with the pieces of multiple power domains and how the budgeting and all the things we deal with the different power domains when we have in a how we approach the situations. It's just discussed here in this slide. We are done here. Let's move on to the next slide. Parman hotspot by IR drop. The heat produced in a chip is proportional to the dissipated power. That is what I touched base in the fundamental slide where I have shown the relation of V, I and R. So I square R is power dissipation which causes the heat and all those things we have done in our fundamentals in our textbook. An excessive power dissipation during the operation will increase the circuit temperature well beyond the safe zone causing the permanent physical damage. Such zones are predicted by dynamic IR drop analysis and referred to as hotspots. Now, how do they look? They look like this. So you can see different colors. And these are heat signatures radiated by IR drop analysis inside a chip. So you can see there are different color gradients here in the right hand side picture. Generally from green towards the red, we more approach the more hot regions are there. So this thermal signature is kind of similar to if you see the infrared detection of heat sometimes used in medical sciences. In the videos where a human body temperature is scanned by the different scanners. So there you also find some similar heat signatures. They are then kind of color gradients are used here we do it by the IR drop analysis tool and we have a similar kind of heat signature happening inside the entire chip we have some zones which are less heated we have some zones which are extremely heated here in the ice color in the red so obviously the tool will give you the legends about the power ratings and dissipations happening for each of the color so this is the heat signature these are called the thermal hotspot where different spots inside the chip can get heated and over time they are not cured then they will cause the permanent damage. That is the purpose of the air drop analysis to detect these hotspots and correct them way before the sign off. Thermal gradients are hotspot due to the various different functional blocks with different power dissipation over current or voltage stress for a long time of continuity. Generally, our chips, if it is a handle device, they are switched off. But in case of say network routers or servers, they will be kept on and on, on and on for a long time. So these are under the constant current or voltage stress. So if any hotspot generates in, in such a chip, over time, they will grow and become packed. And the damage will happen to a large part of the circuitry. All these thermal hotspots are detected by dynamic drop analysis and they are cured by the engineering changes so that things are well taken care of before the chip goes into the hands of the end customer. Here we are done with this particular slide. Let's move on to the next slide. Here in this slide, we'll talk about the IR drop mitigation. So far, we have discussed about all the reasons behind IR drop, how we detect the IR drop, and our detection procedure theories we have covered so far. Now, here in this slide, we'll talk about some of the mitigation methods in the upcoming points. High IR drop impact on the clock tree network causing the full time violation while the IR drop data path signal nets are caused data time violation. I've also touched with this point, this particular point, few slides back. To deal with such situation, one may separate the standard cells with high switching activity apart so that the burden on a given bump feed many standard cells can be mitigated. The lines coming from IO pad into the power wings and then going for strips, those will be well taken care if separate out zones where there is a higher switching activity and there is a less switching activity. So chances will be less of getting hotspots and uh, the circuit will be cured of the IR drop violation. And these are the methods, the engineering changes we are going through in this air drop mitigation slide. With padding, clock cells technique, clock buffers or inverters and clock gate cells are given extra space to keep out regions to avoid placement of standard cells and any excessive cell density around them. Decap, that is decoupling capacitor, insertion around the cells within a dynamic IR drop hotspot region is another way of mitigation. High driving strength standard cell create a dynamic IR drop issue because if the driving strength is high, it will draw more current and more current and cause a more dynamic IR drop in the long run with respect to the time. Self padding is used for these cells or we insert the decap cells around them to mitigate the IR drop. So these are two examples of the engineering changes after we detect the IR drop hotspots through a preventive analysis. In case we find the hotspots, we apply one of these 
this technique sometimes as per the design and case by case basis here you can find a different solution as per your own work experience so please uh, let me know in the comment you have uh, used uh, some other techniques for airdrop mitigations to share with others we're done with this particular slide let's move on to the next slide summary here let me summarize the entire discussion we have done so far in the past slides in this episode most of the times the undetected silicon ir drop may lead to appropriate voltage not reaching the transistor in emos very simple point because if the drop happens that amount of voltage is subtracted from the power line and the end cell the lip cell will not get the desired amount of voltage because of the kvl right this can be compensated by increasing the supply voltage but may contribute to the timing analysis failure for extreme cases. If the IR drop exceeds a specified threshold, typically say 10% of the VDD, the chip could become defective, the kind of de facto standards that we use in a design house. IR drop analysis is necessary for both at the block level and the chip level to assimilate preventive design strategy. IR drop gets to be bigger problem as lower supply voltages are used in lower technology known. IR drops in metal routes cause the wires to heat up. Oxide is a good heat insulator. So over time, IR drop may build up heat in the metal routes. This can degrade metal wires resistance and performance over time. When the wires get hotter, they become more resistive, causing more IR drops and more heat until the wire melts down. For thermal runaway, this may cause burnout problem. So, we are done with this particular slide. Let's move on. If asked in interview, do you know what is ground bounce? Do you know what are the factors in a chip that controls the ground bounce? Do you know? the methods which can mitigate the ground bounce let's start our journey to know all the answers hey guys welcome back in today's episode we are going to discuss the below points first we will do an introduction to the concept of the ground bounce next we will do the correlation of power and ground bounce next we will walk through a couple of techniques through which we can mitigate the ground bounce Next, we will highlight the power gating technique, which is one of the most used mitigation techniques for ground bounds. And our episode will end at this point. Here we are done with our menu for today. Without any further delay, let's begin. Introduction Power supply noise and ground bounds can cause considerable path delay variation in VLSI circuit. Generally, we have two lines that is VDD and ground right in any VLSI circuit. So, noise in either can cause path delay that is delay in the timing in any of the VLSI circuit. And if there is a delay, then it affects the performance of the chip. So, here is the grave importance of dealing with the ground bounds. Ground bouncing noise is the primary cause of pulse switching in high speed circuit and a major cause of poor signal quality. This is the immediate impact. This one is the ultimate impact and this is the immediate impact of the ground bound. To the shared ground or power distributed network during the wake up event, the bouncing noise generated in one of the power domain is transferred to the active block which will flip the logic states. So, in some episodes, I have discussed about the power domain. I'll provide the link in the description. Please watch it for understanding the power domain. Now, when one particular power domain is in the sleep state, that means uh, we have several blocks, right? When a particular block is there and it is waking up because of the external signal or maybe some sequence of the signals that is already there is coming from a particular block. So, during that particular event, these things can go, this false switching and noise, all these things from one block to the another. And it can flip the logic gate state. That means it can flip 1 to 0 or 0 to 1. That means it actually disturbs uh, data transmission inside among the different blocks. And definitely that will be a functional failure. This noise is known as ground bounce noise. Whatever we have talked about, right? All these effects are summed up as ground bounce noise. Generally, any disease is detected by the symptoms. So, we have talked about the symptoms and the disease is a ground bounce. Major component of the circuit noise is inductive noise. Now, we are entering into the classification. What type of noise they or impact they within the circuit and impact the circuit? There is an inductive noise. 
It is a critical and challenging design task to control the amount of the inductive noise that is transferred into the power planes. Here we are done with this particular slide. Let's move on to the next slide. In the next slide, we are still continuing the introduction. Package pins, pounding wires and on-chip IC interconnects all have parasitic induct. We were talking about one of the root cause, which is the inductance noise, right? So, where does it come from? It comes from the parasitic induct. Like we have parasitic R and C extracted during the PAVE extraction or DSP extraction. Similarly, yes, we can also extract the ductiles. That inductance does stay within the VLSH and this causes runbound. When an inductor current experiences time domain variation, a voltage fluctuation is generated across the inductor. Now, what is a time domain variation? That means we have a transient behavior. Any circuit behavior that is changing with time that impacts inductor. Because if you remember in your class book, right, there is a transient response for the both RC circuit and the RLC circuit. When the R, C and L coexist in the VLSI chip, obviously the transient effect will impact all of them and in return, we will generate some bad effects, one of which is the ground bounce. This voltage is proportional to the inductance of the chip package interface and the rate of change of the current. We are very specific here, not, nothing more to say about this point. As a result, when the logic cells in a circuit are switched on and off, the voltage levels and the power distribution lines of the circuit, it is also very very plain and simple. If we have a noise, it is going constant, right? If we have a noise going like that, obviously this level will be impacted by the superimpose of the noise, that is the stating here. This inductive noise sometimes referred to as the simultaneous switching noise because it is most pronounced when the large number of I.O. drivers switch simultaneous. Now we are talking about the chip packaging where the I.O.s are there and the inductance comes from that particular point and we coin a term called simultaneous switching noise. And it is nothing but the inductive noise, right? The I.O. pads or connection of the wires, they are there, they exist there. And that wires interconnects, they also contribute to So, Apart from the parasitic inductors coming from the silicon, we also have the I.O. pads and from where the inductance behind the ground bounce does exist. Now here we are talked about the general concept of the ground bounce through the introduction and we have given some of the background reasonings why the ground bounce happened. So let's move on to the next slide. We are done here. Correlation of the power and ground bounce. As the noise comes in, the noise affects both the power rails. That means the VDD as well as the ground. So how does it look? It looks like this and we are explaining here. So this is our VDD line, this is our GND line and the noise, the noise is occurring here. We generally refer to it as the voltage drop and uh, it, it is impacting the ground line, the ND line. Then this uh, noise will be termed as ground bounce. The ground bounce is nothing but ground noise. Power bounce is the noise glitch on the power line, is the power bounce. When ground bounce and the power bounce are in phase, is the common mode noise. They will not affect the local logical cells, but will degrade the signaling between the distance transmitter and receiver, that is TX and RX. Generally, if these two are in phase, this one and one is in phase, it will not impact the immediate circuit. Rather, if we have a block here, which is the TX, right? TX, and we have a block at other point of circuit, RA, you know, right, the VLSI wearings inside a chip runs in the length of kilometers although the chip is add all the routing so when a trust signal is going wrong if we interpret the signal here and here these two signals here and here may show a difference because of the run bounce the power bounce noise so that in turn impact the signal exchange between the tx and r when ground bounce and the power bounce are out of phase, differential mode noise, out of phase, they adversely affect the local logical cells causing jitter in timing circuit. When these two, right, these two are out of phase, not in the same phase, they will be impacting the local logical cells. That means which are there maybe in the path or maybe there is some, here is our TX right and here. This path it may not be where at all and there might be circuitry which is processing the signal before going to the RX and also it can impact the logic cells here 
here, right? Because we don't know how our chip is there, how it is designed. We are giving a general guideline here. You are the best judge when you are working on your chip. You can actually interpret these concepts into your theory. Round box mitigation techniques. Many design techniques have been used to reduce the effect of the ground bounce such as power getting technique, stacking power getting technique, various empty CMOS technique, these are nothing but multi-threshold CMOS, adding decoupling capacitors that is decap, having separate ground buses for IU buffers and internal circuitry, widening ground interconnect buses, evenly distributing circuitry among power and ground. Previously, in couple of sites, we have talked about the ground bounds and the visual representation of it and the in-depth impact of it. And here we have listed a couple of methods which are used in the VLSI design area for different kinds of need and different kinds of circuitry to combat the, as this is a part episode about the ground bounds, we are not able to accommodate all of these techniques and their details. In case you need them, just please write down in the comments. We will create more FAQ episodes per topic basis. That means if you are asking, we will create for each of them here in this page. However, we will touch this one of the most used technique that is power getting picking. We are done here. Let's move on to the next slide. Power getting technique. We are touch basing here in this particular slide about the power getting technique which is one of the very very popular method to tackle with the ground bounce. Power getting technique is widely used in VLSI to significantly block the leakage currents in standby or sleep mode. Here a sleep transistor is added between the actual ground rail and actual circuit ground also known as the virtual ground. Since we are giving a brief description, we are not diving deep, we are just touch basing so have to survive with all these short and sweet descriptions and uh, to understand from these two points right, this method is for the sleep mode right and how it is done first we add a sleep transistor between the actual ground rail and the actual circuit ground also known as virtual ground. During the sleep mode, this device is turned off, cut off the leakage path from the ground. So, it cuts off the ground path, hence no noise is coming from the ground and hence the power and the ground bounce but mostly the ground bounce is blocked, right? Here, power supply causes virtual ground rail to charge up close to supply voltage VDD which in turn suppresses the leakage. This is another part of this. However, when the sleep transistor is turned on, the virtual ground ray is stored to its act. This way, the restoration happens that we open up the channel again. This way, we control the entrance of the ground bounce noise into a particular block or into couple of blocks. Here we are done with this particular slide, giving you a brief description of the power getting technique. Let's move on to the next slide. Thank you very much for watching up to this point and don't forget to like, share and subscribe in case you have some dislikes. Put that as in words in the comment section down below. And bye for today.